before I get started, I, I just kind of want to get, I just want to say, you know, we're, we're in Nashville, Tennessee this year, and uh, uh, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm kind of a, a stuffy West Coast city dweller, and Nashville has not really been on my bucket list for places to visit. Um, it was not really on my radar, but since the conference was here this year, I uh, uh, decided to come a few days early, so I, I, my wife and I came uh, on Friday, and we, uh, we got a chance to, to check out the city, check out some of the venues, uh, check out some of the music. Uh, and I gotta, I gotta admit, uh, I was really blown away. Uh, this, this is an amazing place. Um, uh, we, we really loved it. How, how many of you had a chance to, to check out some of the, the, the places so far? Check out some shows? Just a few. We're here for three days. Uh, that's, that means several evenings. And so I really encourage you, if you, if you get a chance, uh, go out and check out the city. Go out and, and, uh, and just, just walk into pretty much any music venue, any, any jazz club, anything. Uh, you won't regret it. You, you won't be disappointed. Uh, there's, a, there's some amazing talent in this city. Um, so, uh, that's, anyway, that's, that's enough uh, sermon from me. Um, we, uh, we're going to have a gripe session today. Yeah. Gripe session, yeah, that's right. Um, we're going to gripe about Ruby and DSLs. Uh, and again, for those of you just coming in or those in the back, please move forward. There's, a lot of, uh, there's plenty of open seats and there's a lot of code on these slides. And so uh, it'll be good to, to get uh, closer so you can see. So not long ago, I had to write uh, a Sinatra app for my day job. Uh, this is kind of a simplified view of what the code was. Basically, its job was to invoke a shell command and capture its output, uh, and then kind of format that output as JSON and send that as the response. All right, so really simple, straightforward app. I figured, hey, I've, I've done Sinatra before. What could possibly go wrong? I tested it uh, locally just to make sure. And as it turns out, there was a bug. Can anyone see the bug? Anyone see the bug? Raise your hand if you think you know what the bug is. Okay. Few hands, a couple of hands up. If you have your hand up, I might call on you. So, uh, <laughs> okay. For the rest of you, here's a hint. This is the stack trace that you get. Anyone see it? Who thinks they know what's, knows what's going on? Okay, no one's hand is up now. Okay, what, what do you think is happening? The invoke method needs a, a, a symbol to. Oh, inside the echo. Okay, so in, inside the echo, there needs to be a symbol that, to, for it to be ex executed. Uh, not quite, not quite. Okay, well, we'll, 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 just, we'll just move on. Um, uh, so the, the problem is here. The problem is this call. Uh, it turns out that Sinatra has an internal private method named invoke. And so this line here actually calls Sinatra's method, not my helper method that I have there. Of course, you know, it's a bit tricky to, to, to see that, right? The, the, the calling conventions don't match up. We get this obscure exception here that's hard to parse. Uh, it's, it's hard to know what's going on unless you dig into Sinatra's source. Uh, and you understand what its DSL is doing. Uh, now, it's not my point here to, to pick on Sinatra. Uh, th this happens a lot in Ruby uh, across, many across many libraries, especially when DSLs, domain-specific languages, are involved. So we're going to spend this session griping about this. We're going to spend the session talking about this. We're going to look at how DSLs work. We're going to see why some ordinary Ruby code can sometimes make DSLs go wrong. And then we're going to study some techniques that you can use to kind of help harden your DSLs against problems like that. OK? Uh, quick intro before I get too far. This is me. My name is Daniel Azuma. Uh, I've been a Rubyist since uh, about 2005-ish, uh, right around the time that Rails 1.0 came out. Uh, I've done a variety of things, did, done some Rails startups. Uh, currently. I work at Google Cloud. Uh, I'm a Ruby engineer there. We don't do a whole lot of Ruby at Google, um, but uh, there are several of us uh, that, uh, a bunch of us that, that work there, 
and a lot of us, what we do is we're kind of consultants uh, for Ruby's or Google's uh, engineering teams. Um, so that's a lot of my role. My role is to kind of go to uh, the, the engineering teams that are building Google Cloud and help them tailor their products for our needs as Ruby developers, uh, to help them understand our idioms, uh, our tools, our practices, uh, so that Google's Cloud will work well for, for Ruby developers. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some Ruby practices uh, around DSLs. And I'm going to take a stab at defining DSL uh, before we get started. The, uh, uh, the talk previous to this uh, went through a, a lot of uh, definition time. Uh, and definitions are important, uh, especially when you're talking about some of these things, because as the, as the last speaker mentioned, uh, Ruby sometimes uh, has different concepts. So the concepts work slightly differently in Ruby uh, than in other languages. Uh, when I speak of DSLs, I'm talking about bare methods that are not part of core Ruby. Bare methods. So what does that mean? Bare methods, uh, I mean methods that don't need a receiver object to be called. So methods like putS or sleep uh, that, that look like commands in Ruby. Uh, so those kinds of methods, but methods that are provided by a library. They're not part of the, the standard library or the core of Ruby, but they're part of a, a kind of an external library, a third-party library. So DSLs, uh, they, they're very useful. They can make for some very nice, uh, expressive, uh, concise code. Uh, looking back at our Sinatra example, that get method there is uh, called without a receiver object. It's called at the top level, uh, but it's being used as if it were, being, it, it were part of core Ruby, right? But it's not. It's part of the Sinatra DSL. Now, how does Sinatra accomplish something like this? Sinatra adds this method to the main object, the main object. This is an object that is considered to be self when, uh, when you're at the top level of a Ruby file. So every Ruby application has one of these objects. And we'll talk about this more in a bit, but first, here's another example of a DSL. This one's from Rails. Who's a Rails developer here? Okay, a lot of us. That's right. Um, a lot of us came to Rails, came to Ruby through Rails. That, that was my story. Um, and I know a few of us like to bash on Rails a little bit, uh, just because it's, you know, it's big and, and, and bashable. Uh, but really, is, it, it's, a, it's a nice, solid library. It's a nice, solid framework, and that's why a lot of us use it. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, it's, it works so well is because of how strategically it uses metaprogramming and DSLs internally uh, to be expressive. Uh, and so here's an example from Rails routing. Uh, I copied this uh, directly out of the Rails routing guide here. Uh, and again, we have methods that are being called without a receiver, and those aren't part of core Ruby. Those are methods that are defined on a mapper object. Uh, it's, uh, in, it's a uh, class on, in the router uh, section of As Action Dispatch. So when you call routes.draw, in your routes file, and you pass it a block, that block gets executed using a Ruby construct called instance eval. Uh, so within the block, what happens is self, the, the current Ruby object, gets set to another object. In this case, it gets set to a mapper object. And so within the block, self is set to the mapper, and you have access to all the mapper's methods, like resource and resolve. So setting self within the block, uh, or adding methods to an existing object. These are uh, two useful techniques. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of DSLs basically boil down to one of these, these two techniques. Uh, they make it look like we're extending the language, uh, extending Ruby. But despite that, it's important to realize that it's still Ruby. We're still writing Ruby even though you have a DSL and it might appear to extend the language, uh, creates new methods that are kind of look like they're part of core, uh, you're, you're, it's still, you're still writing Ruby. And you know what? Users of your DSL know that. Right? They're still gonna be writing Ruby. Even when they're coding to your DSL, they're still gonna expect to be able to write Ruby. They're still ex gonna expect to be able to define classes, define modules, 
uh, write uh, methods, call methods, all the stuff that they expect from Ruby, they're gonna expect to be able to do in your DSL. So as a DSL writer and as a DSL designer, it's important that you have to plan for this. Right? This doesn't always come for free in Ruby. You do have to be intentional uh, about making sure that Ruby works well in your DSL. So we're gonna look at a bunch of examples uh, and to illustrate things, we're going to create a little straw man DSL. So here's some, uh, some example code. I'm gonna call this nanospec. Uh, who, who here uses RSpec? Yeah, a lot of us use RSpec or, or Minitest spec, which is a uh, Minitest uh, implementation of it. Uh, RSpec is a testing framework, uh, very, very well used, as you, as you saw. Nanospec uh, is just gonna be a really tiny subset of RSpec. Uh, here's what you can do with it. Basically, you can create describe blocks, and within those, you can create specs and add code to them. And that's it, nothing else. So no expectations, no mocks, no reporting, uh, just describe and it. So implementing this uh, is not too hard. We'll see the code right here. We'll start by adding a describe method to the kernel module uh, so that it can be called from the top level. So we've got a describe method. Now each describe method takes a block, and that block represents some entity that we're testing. So we'll create a class for that entity, we'll call it entity. And each time we call describe, we'll create an instance of, uh, of entity, All right? Now describe takes a block, uh, so we'll use instance eval to run that block inside the entity object. Uh, and so that when the user calls it uh, within that block, entity is what implements that method. So we'll just fill out the implementation here. We'll, we'll, we'll collect all the specs, uh, store them in memory, and then we'll provide an at exit block so that after, uh, after all the specs are defined, uh, it goes through and runs all of them, uh, and that's it. We have a test framework in 20 lines of code. So very simple, very straightforward. What could possibly go wrong? Turns out quite a lot. So here's a simple example to start us off. Suppose I want to use an instance variable in my spec. Now this is Ruby, we use instance variables all the time. Uh, if this were our spec, uh, a very common pattern is to have before blocks that initialize things and then pass information into your specs using instance variables. So, very reasonable to do this. We were, we were just looking at the implementation, so some of you may have already seen the problem here. Uh, this spec is being run using instance eval, or within an instance eval block. And so, when it runs, self is pointing at an instance of entity. An entity already uses uh, an instance variable called name. So, when we run this spec, it's gonna clobber our name variable in our, ent our entity class. Now, in this case, it's pretty obvious what's going on. It's a very simple example. If this were a more complex DSL, if this were a real world library, uh, and your user clobbered one of your internal instance variables, it would probably be a lot harder to debug. The results could be pretty unpredictable. Uh, you'd have to dig into uh, the, the internals of that class, that DSL class, to really figure out what's, what's going on. So let's stop a moment and think about what's, what's happening here, what's really happening. When you use instance eval, you're setting self. You're setting self and you're running arbitrary code. You're running code that your user is giving you. Effectively, you're bringing that user code into your object. You're bringing that inside your implementation. It's as if that code is just another method in your class. And so your users are injecting code in your class. They can access or clobber any of, your, any of your internals, anything in your class, whether it's intentional or whether it's accidental, they can collide or clobber with your stuff. They have unfettered access. There are no guardrails here. And this is precisely what happens with our Sinatra example, right? That get block is called using instance eval. It runs inside 
Sinatra's DSL object. And it mistakenly calls Sinatra's private method, and then you get this weird exception. No guardrails. So whenever we write a DSL, it's a good idea to put up some insulation. Just to start off, some, some checks, some restrictions in your code to make sure that what your users do in Ruby doesn't stomp on your DSL or vice versa, so that your DSL doesn't interfere with what your users are trying to do when they write Ruby. So here's a simple example of how you can do that. Consider adopting a naming convention. A naming convention for any private names in your DSL implementation. So your instance variables, your private methods. Uh, for example, you can add some uncommon prefix or suffix to your names just to reduce the chance that your users might collide with them. Uh, take our DSL class. We have several instance variables here. We have name, we have specs. We could prefix those instance variables, say, with a double underscore. Now, this, this doesn't prevent users from clobbering those, those variables, but it does make it less likely that your users will accidentally clobber them. And don't forget private methods. You know, even if a method is marked private, it's not really private here, because your users are running in instance eval. Self is set to your, your class, your object. And so your user codes, your user's code can still call a private method within that block. Private is not really private uh, in, the, in the DSL. There really is no such thing, indeed, as private. There's no encapsulation. And so you do have to be very careful with what you put in your DSL class. In fact, it's often a good practice, and here's another uh, useful tip, to move as much out of your DSL class as you can. And a common technique for this is to separate your DSL interface from its implementation. You move the DSL implementation out of your DSL into a separate object and then delegate calls to it. So here's what that might look like for nanospec. Uh, remember, we have this entity class. Uh, it serves currently as both the DSL and its implementation. So it provides that it method, and it stores all the data, and it provides all the code to run all the tests. So instead, what you could do is split that into a DSL class and an implementation class. So the DSL class just implements the DSL methods, such as it, and then all that method does is it turns around and calls an implementation object. And that implementation object then includes all the instance variables, all the private methods, all the stuff that can get stomped on. It's kept in that implementation object away from the DSL where it can't be accessed by accident. So another tip, consider delegating implementation to a separate object. So those are some ways that you can insulate your DSL from incorrect access. But there's another, uh, I would say, maybe more important aspect to making your DSL more robust, uh, and that is to bring the DSL closer to Ruby. Uh, make your DSL uh, look more like normal Ruby and behave more like normal Ruby. So eliminate differences between your DSL and Ruby. Now, what do I mean by that? So again, here's a simple example to start us off. Uh, remember how we implemented describe. We added it to the kernel module, right? This is great. Now it can be called from the top level. And this is how uh, methods like put s and sleep uh, are implemented. They're methods of kernel. So you can call them from anywhere. But remember what kernel is. It gets mixed into every Ruby class. Almost every Ruby class, as we'll see. Uh, but it means, pretty much means that that describe method gets added to almost every Ruby object in the application. And often you don't need to do that. You don't need a describe method on every object. Indeed, doing so increases the risk that something might go wrong because other classes in the application don't expect that describe method to be, to be present. The user's app might not expect its own classes to have a describe method, or Ruby system classes like integer or string to have a describe method. 
And so by adding them to kernel, we've modified more than we intend to. We've modified more than we need to. Uh, and that increases risk. This DSL really only needs that describe method at the top level. We only need it on one object, not all of them, just one, and that's the main object that we were talking about. So don't add it to kernel. Just extend the one object that you need it on. Just extend that main object. So that's what we've done here. We're extending the main object with, uh, with a module that contains that describe method. So another tip, minimize the scope of your changes. Add methods only with when, where they're actually needed. Change as little as possible. Most, uh, most DSLs do, do a reasonable job of this. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Uh, I'm looking at you, Minitest. Um, but generally, you know, this is a very important, uh, very important tip. There is more to it than that, though. We were talking about bringing a DSL closer to Ruby. Uh, and that means minimizing changes, but it also means paying attention to the DSL design making the DSL's design look more Ruby-like, uh, making it fit into a Ruby context. Now, that's kind of hand-wavy, so let's unpack this a bit. And to do that, we're gonna take a look at another issue that comes up uh, all the time when we use DSLs, and that's helper methods, right? As Ruby developers, we like short methods. Short methods are readable, they're more testable. Your users are gonna to want to write short methods. And that means they're gonna to want to write helper methods. They're gonna to want to decompose their logic. Now, when a user decides they wanna use your DSL and they need to write helper methods, where do they put them? Where do helper methods go here? Ruby methods belong in classes or modules, right? We all know that. So what do, we, what do you do if you're using a DSL like this? It has blocks, but no classes or modules. If I define the helper method, where do I put it? What class does it actually end up connected to? How do I call it? Can I call it? This is one of the big challenges of DSL. You're removing Ruby code from their normal context uh, in, as uh, parts of modules, parts of classes. And this creates some ambiguity in the usage. So let's explore this just a bit. Uh, in many cases, what actually happens, uh, what users will actually do is define helper methods at the top level uh, of, the, of the Ruby file. And so if you're, if you're writing a Sinatra app or, or a rake file or one of those, uh, those DSLs, uh, typically this is what you've done, right? You, you, you write the, the helper methods at the top level. Now if we do this, where does that method actually end up? It's part of a class. Object, correct. By default, when you define the method at the top level, it becomes a private method of the object class, okay? Uh, now, since the object is a base class for everything, including your DSL class, this actually works out. Your users call their helper method, and it looks like they're calling it directly, like it looks like this is just a direct method call, but actually, it's, if it's in instance eval, it's being called through the DSL class, your DSL class. And so the method call is going through there, then it's going down to the, uh, the, the super class, which is object, and, and uh, then it finds the method there. So it just kind of happens to work out, but it's a little bit roundabout. Now this ha does have an important implication, and that's basic object. Basic object is intended as a blank slate class, so it has far fewer methods than objects. And that means, uh, for some of us, it can be tempting to use it as a DSL class. Don't do this, because it does not include that user's helper method. That helper method is defined on object, not basic object. So the DSL does not inherit it, and the user cannot call it within that, uh, that instance eval block. Now, it's important to understand uh, what basic object is it kind of takes you out of the normal Ruby class hierarchy. It takes you out of the normal Ruby context. And so some things that your users might normally expect of Ruby will not work. Kernel methods, methods like putS or sleep will not work. Methods of the object class. Some of Ruby's language features, 
are implemented as kernel methods, and they will not work. And of course, the user's helper methods will not work. Now, there are cases when basic object might be useful, but usually it's better to avoid it for DSLs because it takes you out of the Ruby class hierarchy. It increases the difference between your DSL and normal Ruby. Okay, so let's go back to our helper method. What if we move this helper method here, inside the block? So defining a method inside a DSL block, what would happen? What would happen? What would a user expect to happen if you did this? Again, methods are usually defined in classes or modules, not blocks. So we have an ambiguity here. Now, I would argue that for the most part, uh, developers expect lexical scoping when they work with blocks. They expect lexical scoping. They expect methods to be visible based on the lexical structure of their code. Right? So it's useful to know, uh, useful to do as much as possible uh, honor lexical scoping. Honor lexical scoping whenever you design, when you, whenever you implement a DSL. Now, unfortunately, in Ruby, uh, this does not always come for free. Uh, local variables are lexically scoped by default, but methods are different. Uh, you don't always get them for free. So, so let's dig into that a bit. So uh, we've used instance eval to implement this block. In general, if you use instance eval, any methods defined in that block get added to the singleton class of the DSL object. Right? Methods on an in, in an instance eval block are defined on the singleton class. Effectively, the method is added to self. It's methods added to that one object and nothing else. Okay? So what we have here kind of works out, right? Because that method is defined on self and we're in instance eval, so we, we call it, we can call it directly on self, and uh, we're able to, to call it. When you have more than one block, uh, you do have to pay more attention. Uh, say you have two separate blocks like this. Now, lexical scoping implies that these are separate scopes, right? Lexical scoping implies these are separate methods and separate scopes, and they only apply within their block. So you need, to be, you need to make sure that you implement that. Uh, make sure that you have a separate DSL object for each block so that you end up with those separate scopes. Don't reuse that, the, the same DSL object or those two methods will collide uh, and users don't expect that. They expect lexical scoping. What about nested blocks? Now we're starting to get a little more tricky. Uh, both RSpec and Minitest support nested describe blocks. Uh, so it is important, it is an important use case, but it's kind of tricky. That inner block needs to be able to call a method defined in the outer block. Uh, so in this case, try speaking is defined in outer. You expect to be able to call it from inner, uh, but not vice versa. So if, if you defined that method in inner, uh, you would not be able to, ex to uh, you would not expect to be able to see it in outer. So. That means you still cannot reuse the same DSL object for those two, those two blocks. But still, the inner block somehow needs to be able to access methods uh, defined on the outer block. Uh, one approach to solving this is to delegate method calls uh, from the inner object to the outer. So you can use something like method missing, uh, or you know, there, there are various techniques to, to delegate method calls. So if your inner DSL object doesn't understand the method, you should delegate it to the outer DSL method, or DSL object. Or uh, another option, uh, we'll talk about classes next. Uh, if you're using classes, you can have the inner object subclass the outer object. Now either way, Ruby doesn't give you this behavior for free. You, have, you probably have to do this explicitly. Your DSL needs to be intentional about implementing lexical scoping when it comes to methods. Here's another useful technique. Model classes in your DSL. Okay, model classes. Classes. This is kind of what RSpec and Minitest actually do uh, for, 
uh, for describe blocks, not exactly, but close. Uh, they model describe blocks so they resemble classes. Then for each test, uh, they create a new instance of that class, and that isolates tests from each other, right? So it's a, it's a very useful technique. But what's really nice about this is it makes it obvious how helper methods should behave. Like if, if a describe block is a class, then that method is just a method of the class. However, once again, you don't necessarily get that for free. You have to be intentional uh, about it. For example, uh, in this case, you might need to use class eval rather than instance eval to, dis to execute that describe block. Um, that's to make sure those helper methods are added as normal methods and not as class uh, methods, as single not as singleton class methods. Uh, if you've ever wondered about what the difference is between instance eval and class eval, they both set self, uh, but they differ in how they treat method definitions inside the block. Uh, so if you're writing a DSL, it's important to understand that difference uh, and be intentional about using the right construct. Okay. So in general, modeling DSL blocks as classes uh, is often a very useful technique. Uh, again, because classes are a Ruby concept. Classes are a Ruby concept. If you model classes in your DSL, it brings your DSL closer to Ruby. It reduces confusion, it makes it more obvious to your users what's going on. And it can make it easier for you as an implementer to avoid corner cases. Now, a little side note here, uh, constants. Constants raise some of the same questions as, me as method definitions. You know, they're attached to modules or classes usually, so if I define a constant, where does it go? Will I be able to access it? Unfortunately, constants are kind of a pain. Uh, they're not affected by instance eval. They're not affected by class eval. You really can't control very well where they end up. Uh, in hindsight, they probably should have been, uh, but it's not how they work. Uh, so the upshot is, uh, generally, constants cannot be made to avoid, uh, to be made to obey uh, lexical scoping using techniques that we've talked about. So these two constants here, they're in different blocks, and they appear to be in different scopes, but actually they're not. They're not. They both behave as if they're defined at the top level uh, on the object class. Uh, in fact, that second definition is going to trigger a warning because you're actually redefining the constant there. And that's confusing. That's confusing, and, and really there's no way around it. Uh, there, at least there's no good way to fix it. There might be ways that you can hack uh, using eval and some, uh, and some code, code generation, uh, but really the advice that I would give uh, when dealing with constants is actually to discourage your users from using them. And a good way to do that is to provide alternatives. Uh, provide another way to do the kinds of things that you'd normally use constants for. Here's an example from RSpec. Uh, RSpec provides a construct called let. And let gives users an alternative to creating constants. You know, there's an idiomatic alternative, uh, and indeed a better one because it does lazy evaluation. Right? So provide alternatives. Uh, you know, to be honest, Ruby constants are kind of a mess, uh, always have been, and especially in the context of a DSL. Uh, so the more that you can guide your users you know, using alternatives or, or other mechanisms, the uh, more that you can guide your users to avoid them, uh, I think the better off that you'll be. All right, so we've talked about a number of issues here. Uh, we've talked about ways to insulate your DSL from Ruby. Uh, remember, with a DSL, there's no such thing as private. So separate your DSL interface from its implementation. Uh, Use a naming convention for instance variables or private methods. We also talked about designing your DSL to look and behave more like Ruby, more like normal Ruby. So we talked about changing as little as possible. We talked about adding methods only where they're needed. We talked about helper methods, uh, designing for lexical scoping, avoiding basic objects. We talked about modeling familiar Ruby con uh, concepts like classes in your DSL just to eliminate some of that difference, that cognitive difference. And it's important to make your DSL more Ruby-like. In fact, personally, I don't really like the term DSL. 
I used to use it a lot. Uh, I, I've, I've written a fair number of DSLs uh, in my time, uh, both for yeah, just application development as well as for libraries. Uh, I used to call them DSLs. These days, I prefer not to say domain-specific language uh, because we're not writing a language. We're not really writing a language. We're writing Ruby. We're always writing Ruby. We're creating DSR, domain-specific Ruby. We're still writing Ruby. I think it's very important to keep that in mind as we do this. Ruby's metaprogramming techniques uh, are very, very powerful. They're very, very useful. But the more we treat them as a separate language, the more we try to divorce it from Ruby, uh, the more we open ourselves up to a lot of risk. Uh, and that, that, I don't think that's really necessary. So instead, think of it as just Ruby. When you design your next DSR, think about how you can make it look like Ruby. Think about how you can make it smell like Ruby. Don't stray too far from Ruby idioms, Ruby concepts, Ruby constructs. Model it after Ruby. And I think you'll find that you'll end up with a much more robust uh, and a much less confusing experience for your users. Thank you for coming.